Good morning, church. You know, as we were praising, um, I was reminded of a time when my, my, my sister passed away last November. And I, I was reminded of a time when we would be singing and praying with her. She was out of breath. She couldn't sing. She couldn't pray. She would just be moving her lips. And I was standing there, I'm thinking how much sometimes we take the gifts that God gives us for granted. We have an opportunity to come here to praise him, but we miss it. And it's during those moments, really, that we look back and we are in awe, indeed, of the grace and the goodness of God over our lives. We are in the series of James. Last week, Charlotte preached uh, on the unruly tongue and how difficult it is to tame the tongue. And this week, we're going to continue. Uh, we're still on James chapter 3, we, but this week, we're going to be talking about wisdom. Uh, we're going to be looking at wisdom, definitions, source, maybe some applications uh, in terms of how can we apply wisdom in our lives. So I'm not going to waste time. Let's get straight to it. James chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to start reading from verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of, wit, of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin by just trying to look at the definition of, of uh, wisdom. Uh, the Greek lexicon will tell you uh, about the word Sophia, which, or from which we get the word wisdom. And amongst the many definitions, I'm just going to look at two definitions which points to intelligence, and another one points to the wisdom of God, as in the ability of God to know exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And now, when you, when you, when you look at it from that perspective of saying, that's the definition. But we come back to James. James will, gives us two categories of, of wisdom. James talks about a wisdom that is earthly or from below. He also talks about a wisdom that is from above. Wisdom that is earthly will always point to the fallenness of men. And wisdom that is, a, or that is from above will always point to the goodness, the divinity, his majesty, and so on. But now, when you, when you, when you hear me say that, Please don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying as, as if I'm saying there is nothing good about the wisdom that is from the earth. I'm going to give you an example. Pharmaceutical scientists, who are the ones who actually do the research about the pills and so on, they will come up with a solution to a particular illness. And process goes, the doctors will become aware of that groundbreaking research, and then when you go to the doctor, the doctor will prescribe that medication, you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist will give you the pills. But now, in taking the pills, the wisdom that is from below will always point to the doctor or the scientist. But the wisdom that is from above will always point back to God. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Which means, when you look at the scientists, the scientists went away to nature to get the ingredients to make the pills, 
to inform the doctor that, hey, I now have a solution. So which means wisdom that is from above will tell you that when I take the pills, because there's nothing wrong with taking the pills, but when I take the pills, I don't take the pills as a, as a way of saying I'm now looking at the doctor as the healer. But I take the pills and give expression to God or give thanks to God in saying, thank you, Lord, for giving the scientists the wisdom, the intelligence. Thank you, Lord, for giving the doctor you know, the, 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 the same intelligence that now I can be able to go to him and get healed. And now we come back. So we know the definition. We know the different kinds. But if we just go back a little bit, because now the, the question is, how exactly does one get to be wise? Or how do you get wisdom? If you go back to James chapter 1, verse 5. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Which means, number one, if you want wisdom, you, you ask God. But maybe I'm not going to be able to read all the scriptures. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the different spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit, one of the gifts is wisdom. So which means... If, I, if I'm seeking wisdom, the first point is I ask God. Second point, I understand that wisdom is a gift. It is given as a gift. You go to uh, 1 Corinthians. In fact, let me, let me read this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading from verse 28, I think. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 28 says, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So I ask God for wisdom. I, I received wisdom. Wisdom from God as a gift, but the gift that I receive is Christ himself. And if I receive Christ himself, then we have to now go back and go to Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? They give various responses, Elijah, Jeremiah, and so on and so on. But then Peter says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus says, bless you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. Which now takes us to this picture or this understanding that says, if Jesus is wisdom and I receive wisdom from God as a gift, I cannot be able to understand what I have received as a gift up until I have a revelation of the gift or of Jesus Christ himself. And the only person who can reveal Jesus is God. Which is why we, it, it's like it goes back full circle to say, I receive, but I receive because I asked. And because I asked, it is revealed. And now, you come back to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9, I think verse 10. It says, um, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Which speaks exactly to this idea that I'm, 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 I'm putting forward. To say, fear, we cannot begin to fear anything unless we know it. We cannot begin to fear God unless we know who God is. So that's why it says, it, it, it does not say that it is wisdom, but it says it is the beginning of wisdom because wisdom begins with the revelation. So you begin with the revelation of Jesus Christ and then as Jesus Christ it, he is revealed, you then come to this understanding of saying, I begin seeking a gift, but I receive a person. And the person is greater than the gift because the gift is in the person. Which means, in essence, 
what we are seeking is none other than the revelation of Jesus Christ. There, there, there is um, something that Charlotte um, said last week. She, she used a, a cup uh, in that example where she shook the cup and said, what comes out, we are saying it's water, but in essence, it's what was put in. And now, again, remember, this is a book of James. It's, it's a letter that is read to a church, which means there is a link between these different topics or this concept. So when we look at the tongue, we speak out of what is within. And if we now have this understanding of saying, I need to be able to say what is right when it, when it is right and so on. How do I do that without wisdom? It's the wisdom that guides you into, into knowing what exactly is it that you're supposed to say. And how does wisdom guide you? It guides you because what comes out is Jesus Christ. Which means as you fill yourself with Christ, we, wisdom begins to flow out of you. And as wisdom begins to flow out of you, the words themselves out of you begin to reflect who Christ is As Corinthians says, he is wisdom for us. And now, the the, the Proverbs 9 verse, I I just want to expand on it a little bit. Because it says, fear is the beginning of wisdom. So I have to know this person that I'm fearing. But fear itself, if you look at the definition of fear, it has a number of parts to it, but I'm, again, I'm just going to focus on two. The one part has to do with terror, dread, and so on. But, but the other part has to do with awe. We stand in awe of who God is. He's magnificent, and so on. If you remember the story in Exodus, when um, God came down, it says, in the mountain, there were thunders, rumblings, lightning, and so on, to the point that the people were afraid. But I just want to read this. It, it, it's a bit long, but I, I do believe that it, it does paint this picture of the awe that we are supposed to have of who Christ is. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start reading from verse 1. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, um, was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread and the presents. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. The preparations having thus been made, the priest goes regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink, and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. As in, when you remember the story, Moses was given instructions on how to build the tabernacle, that tent, that physical tent. He was given instructions. But when Jesus died, he entered 
a temple or a tent, not on earth, but in heaven. That's why it is said, the greater and more perfect tent. He entered once and for all into all, in, into, sorry, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Let me stop there. Two pictures, thunders, rumblings, and lightnings, and so on. But this one, we see a picture, a perfect picture of the son laying down his life so that all of us here may enter into the Holy of Holies, may have fellowship with the Father. That is what fear is about. That is what knowing God is about. To say, in, in fact, Charlotte, again, when we were talking, was talking about uh, this book where Aslan, I'm sure most of you know the movie, Aslan is a lion who is a picture of Christ, and the children are about to meet him. And they say, is he safe? And then the answer is, of course he's not safe. He's a lion. That's the God that we serve. Of course he's not safe. But he's good. We hold the two in perfect tension. We don't take lightly who he is by virtue of his goodness. But at the same time, First John chapter 4 tells us that who fears has not been perfected in love. His love, his perfect love causes us that even though we know of, of the dread of him, but his love causes us to enter into the holy places with praise and thanksgiving. And now, as I, as I bring this to a close, uh, I, I want to come to Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3 talks about as we behold this image of Christ, we become like him from one degree of glory to another. We behold the image, we become like the image because that's the ultimate goal, that we become like the image. The revelation of who Jesus Christ is is, is, is exactly that. As Christ is formed in us, we begin to resemble him and become the true ambassadors which we are called to be. So that when people look at us, they see an image of him. But how does that happen? From one degree of glory to another. It's the little moments that God is calling us to that we ought not to take for granted because it, in those moments is the working of God. We seek wisdom. God says, pray, ask me, and I'll give you. It's a gift prepared for you. I will give you. But in giving you, what I'm giving you is my son. But before you can be able to flow in that gift that I've given you, you need to understand the gift itself. You need to understand who my son is. But you will not just understand my son all at once. It's from one degree of glory to another. I'm struggling today in this, but God is at work, moving me from this place to the next to the next. But how he's moving me is that I walk by faith, not by sight, in that I do not look towards what I am able to do, what makes sense. I do not say I will only do up until. I say I do because he has said it. You trust God for the rest because I, I always have this picture. Isaac and, and uh, Abraham, imagine the instruction. Take your only son, go up to the mountain and sacrifice him. If that had been some of us today, 
it would have never happened. Because we want to make sense of things. We want everything to be laid out. We want to know from here to there before we can do anything. But God is saying, I want to give you this gift of wisdom. I want you to be able to discern right from wrong, to be able to reflect who I am. But allow me to be at work in you. Allow me to be at work in you even when it doesn't make sense. Amen.